Hello, everyone, and welcome to the AgriKids webinar. This is a very special event. My name is Alma, and in about 45 minutes, guys, I'm going to be making you an AgriKid. And that means you're going to become an expert in farm safety. And that means you get to boss the grown ups around. You get to tell the grown ups how to behave when they're on a farm when they're around livestock, if you think they might be going to work with some tractors on machinery, you can give them a few pointers to remind them how they must stay safe. So I hope everybody brought their listing gears because we've got loads of work to do, but I promise you it's going to be a load of fun. And at the end of this event, I'm going to be telling you about a very special competition. So what kind of things are we going to be learning about today? Well, this is the number one. No farm safety conversation would be complete if we didn't talk about the number one danger, tractors and machinery. So every time you see a tractor or a piece of machinery, put up your number one finger, okay? Now, we've got to talk about these guys. We're going to be meeting Barney a little bit later on and a few of his buddies. So we're going to be talking a little bit about the, how the animals tell us if they're in a good mood or a bad mood. We're also going to be reminded how we know and when we can recognize certain dangers whenever we go and visit a farm. So for example, if you were on a farm and you saw a shed full of bales, do you think that'd be a good idea to go in and start climbing? If we look at the bales in this shed, they're not stacked very well, are they? They look a bit wobbly. They look like they might fall. So let's make sure we never go climbing on bales in case you wobble and fall. What a good farmer we have here. We're going to learn a little bit about the different chemicals that we might use around our farms and the different medicines for the animals. And if we look at this farmer here, they're doing a really good job in staying safe. They're protecting their hands and their skin and their face. And just underneath that mask, I think I can see a kind of breathing apparatus, something to help them stay safe so they don't breathe in any of the, the fumes. That's a really good, good job. Oh, what, what's that smell? Whew. Oh, guys, we're going to be learning a little bit about slurry. We're going to find out what it is, where it goes, and what it does. But before any of that, we're going to have a little story. And I'd like you all to say a very nice hello to Tom, Sarah, and their very good friend, Mr. Bramble. I've written some books for boys and girls all about how we can stay safe on the farm. And the story we're gonna do now is called The Tree Swing. And we're gonna find out what happened when Tom and Sarah went to the farm on their own. Not a good idea. Let the story begin. Down a twisty lane near the village of Ballymally, you'll find Riverside Farm. Tom and Sarah live on Riverside Farm with their mammy and their daddy and their sheepdog, Meg. They've loads of animals on their farm, like hens and geese and sheep and cows. But the children's favourite animals were the hens, because every day after school, they got to gather up the eggs and bring them home to make scrambled eggs and toast for tea. Now, as we all know, Farms are very busy places and every autumn daddy is back out in the red tractor plowing up the field and getting it ready to sow the next crop. But for our story today we're going to pretend it's the summer and the children just got their summer holidays. I'm bored said Tom. Me too said Sarah because there's nothing to do. Nonsense says mommy there is loads to do. In fact, why don't you two go outside and see if you can find your tent? If it stays nice and dry, you can camp outdoors and pack a picnic tea. Yay, said the children, and out they ran as quickly as they could. In no time at all, they had their tent put up, and that night they were all snug in their sleeping bags, drinking hot chocolate and eating their picnic tea. Yummy, said Sarah. Sandwiches taste much better outside. Meg the sheepdog was there too. She wanted to get a few of their sandwiches. Suddenly Meg began to sniff the air. Dogs can smell things that we can't. 
Then she began to growl and bark. What's wrong, Meg? asked Sarah. Is there something outside? Sarah zipped open the tent and Meg dashed out. Row, 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 row. She was growling and barking at the hedge right beside the tent. Tom, said Sarah, I think there's something in that hedge. Sarah went to get a closer look and from deep inside the hedge, she heard a little voice say, help, please, help, I don't like dogs. Tom, said Sarah, there's somebody inside our hedge and they need our help. Tom came out of the tent and threw his half-eaten sandwich to Meg, who dashed off after it. He Hello, said Tom. It's safe to come out now. Are you sure, said the little voice. Is that dog gone? Yes, said the children. And suddenly the hedge began to glow. It glowed and glowed and glowed and got so bright the children had to cover their eyes. And when they opened them again, they couldn't believe what they saw. A creature no bigger than a tin of beans was fluttering right in front of their eyes. He was able to fly because his ears were as big as butterfly wings. He was the weirdest creature the children had ever seen. Who are you? asked Tom. The little creature lifted his hat from his head and says, how do you do? I'm Mr. Brambles. Are you a fairy? asked Tom. A fairy? said Mr. Brambles. I'm nothing like a fairy. Fairies are only good at collecting your old teeth and being very bossy. I am a hedge sprite and our magic is far more important. Yeah, right, said Sarah. What kind of magic does a hedge sprite do? Hmm. Now, everybody, can you tell me, have you ever smelt a flower? Ever seen blackberries appear in a bush? Leaves going from green to brown? Green fields turning golden? Because if you did, then you have a hedge sprite living very close by because they make all the magic of nature happen. Wow, said Sarah. That's amazing magic, Mr. Brambles. But look at you, you're shivering. Would you like some of our hot chocolate? It'll warm you up. <laughs> Inside the tent, Mr. Brambles slurped very greedily on his hot chocolate. Oh, children, he says. Thank you so much for saving me. I don't like dogs very much. That's okay, said Tom. I'm just glad we're at the right place at the right time. In fact, said Mr. Brambles, I'd like to be able to help you guys one day. But you must remember to call me a very special way. So remember this rhyme. Should you ever be in fear, call three times and I will hear. Let's say that together. Should you ever be in fear, call three times and I will hear. And with that, he fluttered those huge ears and disappeared in a flash. Well, the children were so excited, they didn't sleep a wink. And the next morning they gobbled down their breakfast and ran outside to try and find their little friend. But they couldn't find him anywhere. I know, said Tom. Maybe Mr. Brambles is down on the farm. We could look there. Now the children knew they were never to visit a farm alone, but they really wanted to find Mr. Brambles. Come on, Sarah, said Tom. Mammy and Daddy will never know. Down on the farm, Daddy and Jack the farmhand were very, very busy scraping out the cow shed of all the stinky cow poo. Ew, said Sarah, that is disc. Shh, Sarah, said Tom. If Daddy and Jack hear us, we'll be in so much trouble. Come on, let's look over here. The children ran to the back paddock. Maybe Mr. Brambles was going to be in there. But instead of finding Mr. Brambles, the children found something else, the old tire swing. The swing had been there a very, 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 very long time. And the rope was very old and very tatty and not very safe. Oh no, oh no, Tom, said Sarah, we shouldn't be in here. Come on, let's look somewhere else. But Tom was being very naughty. He climbed into the ring of that old swing and began to swing himself as high and as fast as he could go. Wee, look at me, he said, going higher and higher. Tom, said Sarah, get out of that swing. But the butterflies were tickling Tom's tummy and that made him want to go even higher and even faster. Wee, wee. He said, going higher and higher. Tom, 
said Sarah. I said, get out of that swing. But the wind was whistling in Tom's ears and he couldn't hear his sister's voice higher and higher, faster and faster, until suddenly the old rope began to make a very strange noise. Creak, creak, creak. The noise grew louder the higher and faster he flew. Creak, creak, creak. Tom, said Sarah, please get out of that swing. But Tom still wasn't listening and Sarah was getting worried because the noise was getting louder and louder. She felt something bad could happen at any moment. Was her time to go and get dad? He'd be cross if he knew they were on the farm. Creak, creak, creak. What was Sarah go? Then Sarah remembered. What had Mr. Bramble said the night before? Should you ever be in fear, call three times and I will hear. But could that really work? Creak, creak. Without a second to lose, Sarah closed her eyes and said, um, uh, Mr. Brambles, Mr. Brambles, Mr. Brambles. But it was too late. The rope snapped and Tom wasn't flying anymore. Instead, he was falling all the way towards the ground. Tom, shouted Sarah, covering her eyes. And when she looked again, she couldn't believe what she saw. Her brother not falling, but floating right above the ground floating as if by magic, hedge sprite magic. On his shoulder appeared Mr. Brambles. Oh, Tom, aren't you lucky Sarah remembered what to do? Yeah, said Tom, shivering. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Mr. Brambles. Hmm, said Mr. Brambles. I think swings and things are just for playgrounds or your back garden. Then there was another voice, an angry voice. It was Daddy. He'd heard Sarah shouting and was coming to see what was going on. Oh no, said Mr. Brambles, I can never let a grown-up see me. Remember children, always stay away from, from the farm and we only go with a grown-up. Daddy was very cross with the children. I told you two not to play on that old swing, he said. And what are you doing down here on your own? Did you ask for permission to come down to the farm? No, Dad, said the children. We're sorry, we won't do it again. No, you won't, said Dad, because I'm clearing away that swing once and for all. Now get home, the pair of you, and I don't let me catch you down here again, alone. Later that day, Daddy was still feeling very cross with the children. An accident could have happened, he says, and Tom could have been badly hurt. Daddy had cleared away the swing, and as he threw the tyre with all the other tyres onto the silage pit, he was still wondering what he could do to make sure the children didn't go to the farm on their own. Suddenly, Dad's eyes lit up. I've got it, he smiled. Not long afterwards, Mr. Brambles heard giggling in the children's back garden. He poked his head out through his little hedge house and saw the children playing on a brand new set of swings. Whee, said Tom, as he went down the yellow slide. It was a very happy sight indeed. And as he lay tucked up in his little hedge bed, Mr. Brambles knew there wouldn't be another tree swing on Riverside Farm again. So guys, do we see why we never go to a farm on our own? Because we see how easy accidents can happen. So as my agri kids in training, I've come up with a few ways to help you stay safe when you go to visit a farm. And the first thing we need to do is to make sure we know before we go, some of the things that we might see along the way. But the first thing you need to know before you go is who are you going with? Do we visit a farm alone? So we need to have a grown up with us. It could be your mommy, your daddy, your granny, your granddad, aunties or uncles. It might even be your amuto, your teacher. So does everybody have a grown up that they can go down to the farm with? Good, I'll tick that one off the list. Now, what kind of farm are we going to be visiting? Because there's loads of different kinds of farms. There could be a dairy farm where we get our milk from. There could be a tillage farm where we get vegetables from and we grow grains and cereals. I was even on an ostrich farm once. So it's important to know that when you're going to go and, and visit a farm, that you know the kind of things that you're going to see and the kind of things you need to look out for. So do we all understand the kind of farm we're going to be seeing? Good. Now, here's the thing. Are there any big jobs planned on that particular farm? Like, for example, 
is there going to be animals moved or is there going to be a harvest on? They're going to be having a lot of machinery driving to and from fields. Is it silage time? Are they moving bales of hay? Because if there are big jobs planned, trust me, the farmer is very busy and does not want any visitors coming, okay? And, and you know what? They're going to be so busy and it's always better to wait until those jobs are done because then the farmer is in a much better mood to show the, the visitors around. So if there are big jobs planned on the farm, let's stay at home and wait until the farmer has the jobs done. Now, what kind of things do we need to wear? Say hello to Isabel. Hi, Isabel. Isabel is my very good friend from County Clare. And Isabel is great at helping Grandad with, with calves. Okay, she's very good at feeding them. But you all see what Isabel has on? Mm -hmm. When she's walking, maybe into school or when she's going to visit the farmyard, she'll always make sure that she is visible by putting on her high-vis vest. So does everybody have a high-vis vest? Yeah, some do and some and some don't. Well, you can get them from the Road Safety Authority. Mm -hmm. So if you ring up, you'll be able to get one delivered. And if you look up on the internet, you'll be able to get one sent out to you as well, okay? So does everybody have their high-vis vest? Great job, well done. Oh, angry kids, I have a top tip. Now, does everybody know what their air code is or what their postcode is? Mm -hmm. Well, it's a really, really cool thing, right? The air codes and postcodes tell the postman and the delivery people and the pizza delivery guys exactly where you live. And it's a sequence of numbers and letters. And every household has, has one, okay? And it'll tell them exactly where you live. And they'll be able to get to you just like that. But not only for postmen and couriers and pizza delivery, it's also a great way of helping the emergency services find you if they need to get to you very fast. So, for example, instead of me having to tell, you know, the ambulance guys, oh, um, I'm just down the road, around the corner, on the right, up the hill, down the mountain, around the dock. No. All I have to say is A92HP88. And they'll know exactly where I am. So I think it's a good idea to learn off by heart what your air code and postcode is. OK, because you never know when you're going to need it. And would you do me a favor? Test the grown ups. See if they know what their codes are, okay? Now, the last thing we need to know before we go is the different signs we're going to see when we get there. So does everybody know the different signs you might see on a farm? Like the one here might be the first sign you see on the gate before you actually go in. And did you know what those different symbols mean and, and the different colors? Okay, some people aren't sure. So let's go straight in and learn a little bit about the different signs that we see around the farm. But I need everybody to use their magic hands, okay? So can everybody wake up your magic hands, wiggle all the fingers, well done. Because signs are different colors and they're different colors for a very good reason. For example, if you saw a sign that is red, can you all do a big thumbs down? Because it means no, 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 you can't go, okay? But when you see green, it means, yes, you can go. And that's why green is the color we might see on signs over doors, because it's pointing in the direction you need to go if there's an emergency. So red means no, green means go. But what about blue? Can you all point at the screen, wave your finger at me, because when it's blue, then you have to, okay? So in this sign here, we have to wear boots to protect our feet. And when the sign is yellow or even orange on black, we need both hands for this one. It means, uh-uh, careful, watch out, mind yourself. So if you ever notice when people are mopping floors, they might put up a yellow sign warning people that the floor is wet and they might slip. Exactly. So yellow and black signs are mostly warning signs. And they're the signs that we use a lot of on our farm right here in County Meath. So, for example, if I showed you this warning sign, what do we think the dangers might be? Hmm? Shout it at the screen. What, what, snakes? No, not snakes. What? Wires. Yeah. Electrical wires. Well done. I use electricity for loads of things on my farm. 
for example, inside my shed. So I have lights on so I can see all my animals and all my tractors. And if you ever visit a dairy farm, there's loads of electricity. In fact, there's more electricity used probably in a dairy farm than on any other type of farm. But right here on our farm, we have a lot of animals and some of them are very naughty. Some of them are very bold and they love nothing more than maybe to wander off into another field or maybe get a little bit too close to breaking it onto the road. And we can't let that happen. That would be awful. So I use a lot of electric fences to make sure my animals stay in and don't go wandering around. Now, guys, do we use our hands to test if the fence is switched on? No, 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 no. You would get a horrible, 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 horrible shock. So instead, I've come up with a few tips to help you remember how to work out if a fence is switched on or switched off. For example, listen. Because when the fence is switched on, you'll hear a funny noise. Put your fingers together. It'll go tick, 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 okay? Or you can use your eyes. Is there a sign up? For example, a sign like this, letting you know that fence is electrical and you need to keep back away from it, okay? Or you could just simply ask, hey, excuse me, is this fence switched on? Okay, no need to use your hands. But what I'd like to use is something like this, my fence tester, okay? So I put this little bit of copper into the ground and that earths it, which means if this little piece of metal here touches off the electric fence, and if the fence is switched on, all that electricity will go up the black wire and power my little unit here. And all those little black holes will light up, telling me the fence is definitely switched on, and it'll tell me how many volts is going through the wire, up to about 6,000 volts. This can read up to, which is pretty high, isn't it? And the kind of animal I'm gonna put out into a field at a 6,000 volt fence is a BU double L. Mm -hmm. Because trust me, if a bull knows a fence is electrical and switched on, they're less likely to charge through that fence in the event they're chasing after something or someone. Now, what other signs did I bring with me today? It's the number one. Can everybody show me the number one finger? Because guys, remember, this is very important stuff. Now, why are tractors and machinery once again the most dangerous things on our farms and cause the most accidents? Well, I get asked that question quite a lot. And all I can say is, when I was little, that's me, that's me. When I was little, the tractors we had were, you know, a little bit smaller, not very fast, okay? In fact, this is the tractor we had when I was little. It was, a, it was called an international and it was at the same speed as 80 horses. So it's 80 horsepower. And we always measure the speed of tractors in horsepower because horses were technically the first tractors. They pulled the plows. Do you remember that? Of course you don't, you were too little. Yeah, you weren't even born. But we always measure the speed of tractors in horsepower. And when we were little, we thought that tractor was the biggest, fastest tractor ever. But as we got bigger, our tractors did too. And this is the kind of tractor we would have on our farm now, okay? Much bigger, much taller, and much faster. So we've got to be more careful, okay? In fact, we have a tractor at home and the back wheel is bigger than me. Yeah, bigger than me. Can you believe that? And because the back wheel is bigger than me, I'm only halfway up the tractor when I'm here. I still have to get inside the cab don't I? Uh-huh. The thing is, guys, as soon as you get inside that cab, you're very high up off the ground. In fact, if you look up towards the roof, that's where I am when I'm sitting inside my tractor. I'm all the way up there. And when I'm seated all the way up there, all I can see is what's directly in front of me. I can't see who or what is on the ground below. And I won't be able to hear you. I might have these on. Uh, the tractor cab is soundproofed as well. And I might have the radio on, okay? Can't see you, can't hear, hear you. So if we look at James here, what that one thing is James, is he in a good, a good place? No, he is not. He's far too close to that tractor. I won't be able to see you, James, and I won't be able to hear you. It's very important that we understand the blind spots of tractors. And that's the areas 
we won't be able to see you. So when I'm sitting inside my tractor, that's what I can see all the way out there. I cannot see you when you're here or here. In fact, the closer you are to a tractor, the less likely I can see you. So that's why we always got to stay well back from moving tractors and moving machinery. Because when the farmer's up there driving away, they're thinking of all the work they have to, to do. And their vision is very, very bad. Okay. Now, agri kids, what do you put on when you get inside a car? Your seatbelt. Great idea. They keep you safe. So if the, you know, if the car stops suddenly, you wouldn't go flying forward. Okay. You'd be kept safe and sound inside your seat. Well, when I was little, tractors didn't really have seatbelts because they were seen as a bit slow and, you know, they're not really needed. But they're definitely needed now. So if you know of any farmer with a tractor, ask them, you know, do you have a seatbelt in there? And will you remind them to uh, buckle up and to use it? Because inside the cab, we call it the safety zone. And trust me, that's the place that I want to stay when I'm driving. And the best way to keep me inside the safety zone of the tractor is by putting on my seatbelt. So let's all have a quick practice about how to put on a seatbelt. Okay, one, two, three, click. Oh, I didn't hear enough, enough clicks. Let's try that again. One, two, three, click. Much better. Well done. So your first job as agri kids is to remind all the farmers to use their seatbelts and to buckle up. Okay. Give a big clap to Walter using his seatbelt. Big clap to Martin County Mead using his seatbelt. And a big clap to Derek in Kildare using his seatbelt. So let's remind all the farmers to buckle up and to use their seatbelts. Okay. Now, what are the signs that I bring with me? Oh, I don't like that one. I don't like it at all. What does that sign mean? Halloween on the farm? Mm, I don't think so. Pirates on the farm? No. But it's not P for pirates. The danger is P for something else. So pu -pu 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 poison. Something that's poisonous or toxic will have that sign on it. And I'm afraid to tell you, there's loads of things around my farm that I use that would be poisonous if I didn't use them correctly. And those different chemicals that we use on our farm, we call them pesticides. But the only thing you need to remember really about pesticides is the first four letters, which spell pest. Because there's loads of things on a farm that could be a pest that we don't want, that we need to get rid of, okay? That make farming very difficult, okay? Pests such as these guys, rats and mice, do I want them on my farm? No, thank you very much. You don't even want them anywhere near your house, don't you not? No, thank you very much. Eating all my corn and barley, you cheeky little devils. So I will use bait boxes or rodenticides to say bye-bye to Mr. Rat and Mrs. Mouse. Now, another thing is I need to keep my crops healthy. I don't want any diseases or funguses growing on any of my crops, or in fact, any of my lovely flowers come to think of it. So I will use a fungicide to keep all my crops nice and healthy. Oh, look at him. This is an awful pest. Flies and lice on our animals. No, thank you very much. If you know of any farmers with uh, sheep, for example, Fly strike is awful. What happens with fly strike is the green bottle fly lands in the lovely fleece and wool of the sheep, lays its eggs, then those eggs hatch. And what comes out of the eggs? The little maggots. And where do those little maggots go? Down into the animal skin and flesh. And they make the sheep very, very ill. So we definitely don't want that affecting our lovely animals. So we would use an insecticide such as spot on, for example, to make sure our animals stay fly and lice free. But even though that product is very good for our animals and all the, the medicines we use for our animals are good for them, they're not good for us. So if I'm ever using something like a pour on, I will use a glove, like a nitrile glove to make sure none of that product goes into my skin. It only goes into my animal skin, okay? And the last kind of pesticide that I use would be something against the weeds. OK, I don't want weeds taking over my crops and taking away all their nutrients and all their dinner. So I would use a weed killer or a herbicide to make sure none of those 
get in to my lovely crops. Although I will always, I always like to keep a nice strip of wildflowers to encourage the pollinators such as the bees and some birds and butterflies so that they can do their work in creating food as, as, as well. But guys, it's good to know that even though all those chemicals are on farms and there are different warning signs on the back of those chemicals, it's not just on farms that we, we have to watch out because if you even look around your own house, ask your mom or your dad or your granny or granddad to show you some of the polishes or detergents that they might use. And if you look on the back, you might see little warning signs letting you know that you need to be careful. So for example, with something like washing up liquid or shampoos, etc., they get into your eyes, they might you know, cause them to, to sting a little bit. So that's what that, what that warning sign means. It's letting you know that, that product could be a little bit of an irritant. All right, and to make sure you don't get it anywhere near your eyes. All right, so that's why all chemicals, both home and on farms and in schools and everywhere that chemicals are, we need to make sure we lock them up and make sure nobody who's, who doesn't know how to use them gets too close. Okay, but there's one other chemical I want to talk about on our farms and it's a bit smelly. Can you smell that? Ooh, that's a bit stinky. What is that farmer doing? What are they spreading? Sl slurry, yes. What is slurry? Tell me, shout it at the, at the uh, screen. I beg your pardon, it's what? It's poo and it's pee. It certainly is. It's cow poo and cow pee. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yeah. Not just cows though, no. It could be, um, slurry comes from pigs as well or we get some good slurry from chickens. And what do we use it for? It's a brilliant fertilizer. It feeds the grass, doesn't it? It makes the grass grow and it makes the grass grow long and delicious and beautiful. And uh, then what happens? The animals eat it and then the animals are happy, lovely fat tummies, haven't they? Lovely and full. Yeah. So happy grass is happy animals. So slurry is very, very, very important. And we use it a lot on our farms to fertilize and feed our grass. But we've also got to be extremely careful, okay? Because within slurry, when it's left sitting for a long time, a kind of sciency thing happens. Yeah, yeah. Different gases start to build. And the kind of gas that's very dangerous and very poisonous in slurry, I call it the sleepy, sneaky snake gas. So guys, I need you to use your imagination. We're gonna pretend this bottle of cola is our slurry tank. And over winter, we don't spread slurry, okay? It's too cold, nothing grows. And if there's a lot of water or a lot of rain, some slurry might get washed into our drinking water. So we don't spread slurry over the winter. But the thing is, our animals are still doing all their poos, aren't they? So our tanks that hold all the slurry begin to fill up. And inside the tanks, all the bugs and bacteria are eating and drinking all that slurry, breaking it down and decomposing it. Okay, they're having a ball, they're having a great time. But after doing all that eating and drinking, the different gases are starting to build and form. And inside here, the sleepy, sneaky snake gas, the very poisonous gas is getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And the stronger it gets, the more dangerous it becomes. At a very high level, a high strength, it will take away your sense of smell. So we don't even know it's there. So when it comes to springtime, middle to the end of January, we are allowed to once again spread slurry onto our fields. But because we've left the slurry sitting in a tank for so long, we've got to mix it back together again. Something we call, big word alert, agitation. An agitator is like a big mixing spoon that we lower into the tank. And here's one here. And as soon as we start the uh, tractor, the power from the tractor comes down here and starts to power and move the agitator. And it starts to churn and mix slurry back together again, which is brilliant. But as soon as we start the agitation process, we wake something up, we set something free. Sleepy, sneaky snake gas has been released. In fact, the first 30 minutes of agitation is the most dangerous because you've just released all the gas in one go. So all the gas is out there. So it's very important that no farmer is anywhere near the agitator and the tank when we're agitating our slurry. Our farmer here is standing outside the shed. 
good idea. And they need to stay out for up to an hour, okay? Because all, the, all that's needed to make everything safe again is for the gas to come up and for the wind to come along and blow it all away. And that can take up to an hour to happen. But when, that's, when that does happen and all the gas is gone, we can drain our tanks and feed our grass and get ready to grow loads of lovely silage, get hay made or even some haylage to feed our animals for the year ahead. So slurry is great for grass, but it's not good for you or me. And the golden rule is no farmer should be anywhere near the agitator when they're mixing and churning their, their slurry. So that's yellow and black signs, guys. That's why they're yellow and black, because they're warning you to be careful, to mind your, yourself. But what about the blue signs? What do they mean again? Hmm? Point at the screen. When it's blue, then you have to. So now I'm going to test you and see what you're like as agri kids, because you've got to tell me what to do. So if you saw a sign like this, what do I have to do? What do I have to do? Put on what? Glasses, goggles, why? To protect my eyes, okay, I have them on. Well done, thank you, lovely and bossy, I love it. What's that thing? A hat, what kind of a hat? Oh, a hard hat, what do we need a hard hat for? Oh, to protect my head. Okay, yeah, I'll put on, on my hard hat here. Yeah, done, done, absolutely. Boots, yes, listen, got my boots on, brilliant. And what do I have to do here? Put on a, oh, hide his vest. Oh yeah, hang on, no problem, I have one here, yeah. Isabel gave me one for Christmas, she's very generous. Yeah, so we'll put it on. You're very bossy, I absolutely love it. Well done, thank you, thank you. Now, is there anything else you think I need to, to do? Let's have a look here. What, oh, we all know what that means, don't we? Yeah, we gotta what? Wash our hands for how long? 20 seconds, using what? Warm, soapy water. And we've always got to wash our hands when visiting a farm. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a little while, okay? Now, oh, the red signs. What do they mean? Red is a big, <coughs> yeah, it means no. No, 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 you're not allowed in. You have to stay out. You can't cross the road, okay? You have to wait for the green. Because when it's green, you're good to go. Green, will, green signs we see over doors, don't we? And uh, we might see them whenever we can go on an airplane again, yeah? And remember, if and around you see a sign like this, this is the assembly point. It means it's where you stand. If there's like a fire drill, if, if there's an, an, an emergency, you might see something like this in your schoolyard, for example, okay? Or even outside an office block, okay? So that's why signs are different colors, have different pictures. But the last thing we've got to talk about are these guys, the animals, because they don't actually wear a sign to let us know if they're in a good mood or a bad mood. We've got to look and see how they're behaving. And that's the warning sign. So if we look at horses, for example, did you know that horses are very good at telling us how they feel by using their ears? So everybody, show me your horsey ears. I'm gonna teach you how to speak some horse, okay? You ready? When horses are happy to see you, their ears go forward. When they're listening, They'll twist those ears from side to side. When they're very tired, their ears go out to the side. And if they're scared, cross, nervous, upset, those ears go back. And that's a warning sign. When the ears are back, you gotta stay back. So how would that look in the real world? Let's look at this horse. Oh, shh. The ears are out to the side. Head is drooped low. They're having a little sleep, aren't they? They're super chill, chilled out. So shh, we leave them alone for a little while, okay? Oh, this is Maggie. What's Maggie trying to tell me? Is she happy to see me? No, her ears are back. She's not happy. She's not happy at all. Well, I can tell you why Maggie wasn't too happy in this picture, because Maggie is a horse on our farm. Mm -hmm. About two hours before I took this picture, Maggie had become a mother. All right, she'd had a little foal, a little girl foal. A baby horse is called a foal, and a girl foal is a filly. And her little filly foal, her baby girl, only a couple of hours old, was in here wobbling around, getting used to the brand new world it was living in. 
and Maggie has been a very protective mummy and giving us the warning signs to get back. And that's her instinct to protect her baby. Okay, so even though she does know us, she was still letting us know that things were, were different now. And her instinct to protect her, her baby was very, very important. All animals are very protective mums and we've got to be super careful around them. Whether it's a sow, whether it's a ewe, whether it's a mare, whether it's, it's a cow, dog or cat, very, very careful, okay? Oh, look at this horse. What's this horse doing? Look at the ears. Aren't they listening to what the rider is asking them to do? What a very good horse. So here's three horses telling us three different things that they're doing just by using their ears. Aren't they clever? Yeah. And if you're ever like hanging around a horse or approaching a horse or wanting to feed a horse, it's very important to know how to do this correctly. So if we look at Sally here, look how she wants to feed the uh, horse. First of all, I think the food has fallen off the hand. She has it in a little cup. Can you all make a little cup with your hand? We don't feed a horse like that because when you make a cup, you're burying the food further into your hand, okay? And probably the first thing the horse will come across might be your fingers. So the best thing to do is to use a nice flat hand and present the food straight up to the horse, just like that, keeping your fingers and thumbs well out of the way. And you remember I spoke about the blind spot with tractors? Well, animals such as cows and horses, they have blind spots too. And it's important that you don't stand in their blind spot because they won't be able to see you and you could startle them or frighten them, okay? So if you look at the horse here, a horse grazing, if you approach them straight on, they won't be able to see you at this point. And if they put their head up, they'll catch a glimpse and you'll frighten the life out of them, okay? And here at the back, we never approach a horse from behind. They can hear you coming, but they won't be able to see you, okay? And when you approach from the back, you're entering what's known as the kick zone, okay? And trust me, that's a very, very powerful kick zone right there. The best place to approach a horse is at their shoulder, right there, the top of their, their front leg, okay? They can see you coming much better from the side. Front and back, not so good. From the side, very good. And that's why we, we mount horses from the side, we try and feed them and we lead them all from the side. And if you do need to go towards the back, maybe you've got to brush out a tail, use your voice so they can hear you and know it, it, it is you and rub your hand along, the, along the, their, their, their back to reassure them that you're, that you're there to help and not to hurt them. Now, the last animal we need to talk about are these two. Can you all say a very nice hello to Barney? Hi, Barney. And his girlfriend, Camilla. Hi, Camilla. What if I told you, hands up by the way, does anybody think Barney might be the most dangerous animal on our farms? He's very big, yeah? Does anybody think maybe Camilla could be more dangerous? Yeah? Put your hands up if, if you think Camilla is more dangerous. If your hand is up, bring it down and give yourself a pat on the back, because you're right. In fact, Camilla has a very good reason to sometimes be a bit more dangerous than Barney. And in Camilla's case, he's got two very good reasons. Freshly calved cows cause more livestock or animal accidents on farms than bulls. And it's because once again, their maternal instinct is telling them to protect their baby. So as farmers, we've got to be so careful when working with a freshly calved cow. We've got to always make sure we keep a barrier between her and us. So if I have to go in and maybe tag the ear of, of, of a new calf or give it a little bit of medicine, we always make sure we put mum into some kind of a crush or a holding de device so I can go in, do what I need to do and get out before I release mum, okay? She's not being mean, guys. She's just been a really good, good, good mother. And we've got to always make sure we respect that and know that the maternal instinct is a very powerful thing. But that's not to say that Barney doesn't be a bit grumpy sometimes. In fact, bulls are hugely territorial, all right? It's their field and it's their pen. And if they don't want you in there, they will let you know. They might stare you down if you dare go into their field. Look for the sign, look for the bull and don't go in. They might stare you down like that, tossing their head from side to side. They might bellow, Ooh, okay? Not a good, a good sign at all. 
okay? They might scrape at the ground, lower their head and charge and attack. So we've got to be very careful when working or dealing with bulls. And about, about nine or 10 months old, we'll put a ring into their, into their nose. That's a very sensitive area and that calms the bull down. I can put on a rope or a chain and lead and handle the bull correctly, okay? But my granddad always said, never ever put a ring in your own bull's nose. It's not the job for the farmer because it can hurt the bull a little bit. And if the bull thinks the farmer is there to hurt him, will the bull like the farmer? Will they trust the farmer? What might they do to the farmer? Paw the ground, lower the head and attack. So it's very important that we know how to behave when, when in and around bulls. When I'm going into the field with the bull, I'll make sure I'm covered. So I'll be in a vehicle that is covered, like uh, the tractor or the uh, jeep, so I can get in and get out. So it's important that I'm faster than, than the bull, just in case he has a day where he thinks he might attack. My top bull today is Robert. Hi, Bob. You're such a great, great boy. Well done. Now, before I go, look at me. I've got red on, haven't I? Is it a good, good idea to wear red around a bull? Well, it's good to know that bulls are colorblind, so they can't see red. What bulls don't like is movement, things waving or shaking at them. So it's very important that uh, we, do, we don't act silly around, around bulls and we don't wave or shake things at them because that's what triggers an um, attack, not the color. They can't see the, the uh, color, all right? So, so remember, as farmers, we've always got to be super careful and always respectful of our animals. How are we all feeling? You've done it. And remember, you've just been on the farm. You've just met some animals. We've always got to wash our hands after visiting a farm. And if you've been around animals, because there's a thing called zoonosis. And that's when a disease might go from an animal to a person, okay? So by washing our, our hands after coming into contact with farm or with animals, a good hand wash is a great way of keeping us safe and healthy. But sure, we know all about that, don't we? we know, we're so clever now when it comes to hand washing, okay? Well, congratulations. You've all just become my latest agri-kids. So the last thing you gotta do is to make your agri-kids promise, okay? These are three very important promises that will help you and me keep our farms and farmers much safer. So are you ready? I need you all to raise your right hand. <clears throat> Repeat after me. I promise to never visit the farm alone. Never approach an animal. I don't know. Always keep back from working farm machinery. Great job, guys, great job. Now, it's time for some fun. If your mom or dad is, is there, let them know that AgriKids has a website, agrikids.ie. And after doing this webinar, you can now take our, our, our webinar quiz. There's also some activities there, such as spot the dangers, I have helped the animals home, and prize alert, you see that picture opposite? Well, you can download and color in that picture to be in with a chance to win some very special books. My good friends at Flow Gas have made this event possible today and are making all our homeschooling possible at, at the moment. And they have given me some very special books that I will send out to the lucky winner. But you've got to download it, print it, color it in, and email it into agri info at agrikids.ie before or on the 1st of February. Guys, thank you so much for taking part and for listening so well. And if you've any questions at all, just email them into info at agrikids.ie. I cannot wait to see you all again very, very soon. But until then, it's very important to remember to not only be farm safe, but to stay farm safe. Take care. Bye-bye.